Well, as I uh, had mentioned in uh, previous videos, there is the uh, Fish of Lake Mulgory study that we worked on. Lake Mulgory was uh, a restored ecosystem, and then it was stocked with game fish and monitored by FWC. Uh, I had a contact at FWC, and he allowed uh, my classes to come participate in the study while it was being monitored. Uh, unfortunately, he retired. Well, I mean, fortunately for him, but unfortunately he retired. And, uh, you know, the study was over and uh, we were no longer uh, needed. Now, there's Lake Megory and Salt Creek. Boyd Hill underneath it, you can see Boyd Hill. Uh, you can see that it is a brackish estuary, but more saltwater influenced. Uh, but it is connected by, uh, by the airport, the airport downtown, uh, via Salt Creek. So we do have substantial number of uh, brackish water organisms there. Um, so it is an estuary, freshwater and saltwater mix. Uh, it is fairly, fairly fresh, as I said. So, you know, it's, it's more towards the uh, freshwater spectrum of brackish. The uh, original basin is a sinkhole. And then it is connected to the Gulf at Salt Creek. Uh, there are alligators there, as you saw in the video. So uh, there's the, uh, the alligators. So there is a transition between a pure fresh and a saltwater ecosystem. Uh, so in 2009, they started uh, stocking the uh, bluegill and the red ear sunfish. There was a mass snook die-off in 2010. Uh, snook were not stocked, uh, but because there was no uh, predators after that cold snack, the uh, fish, the stocked fish uh, population exploded. So there's a, an electric boat that, uh, well, I mean, the boat's not electric, the, the, um, the uh, electric uh, panels there, and they, they have long wires, and it delivers enough shock to the, uh, the fish to render them unconscious. Then you pull them out with rubber nets and revive them in live wells. And the large ones, you weigh, um, empty the stomach, study the content, see what they're eating, and get a population study. So there's uh, some students on the, uh, on the boat, and then our captain who worked for FWC in the back. Uh, those nets are coated with rubber so you don't get a shock. Uh, so you're driving through the cattails in the eelgrass area, and yeah, I mean, you drive right through them, and uh, the fish float to the top. Then you put them in the live well and uh, bring them back to shore for study. Some of the, the fish, this is one of the rare uh, places where you can catch bass and snook, both of uh, legal size. Uh, that bass is not of legal size there, but they do grow uh, past the, the legal limit. So it's one of those uh, areas where you can find both the freshwater bass and the salt and brackish water snook. Uh, how do you get their stomach contents emptied? Well, I mean, it's, it's not pretty. You stick a hose in their mouth and fill them with water, and then you shake them a little bit with their mouth closed and push and shoot the water out through a strainer. Uh, you weigh and measure them as well. Uh, there's some of the stomach contents. You freeze the stomach contents, you, and then you take them for analysis to see exactly what they're eating and the abundance of uh, food present. So the bass and the snook, they, they're, they're competing for the same, uh, same food. Uh, we also worked with a snook tagging study. Uh, T-shirts were handed out to those fishermen who called and returned uh, the tag numbers. The uh, tagging study was to find out how easily they were moving into and out of Lake McGlory through Salt Creek and into Tampa Bay. So we're tracking the movements of the snook as well. So, uh, you know, you capture your snook or whatever fish, you weigh them, measure them, and then there, there I am. 
uh, inserting a tag just under the dorsal fin. So you go through, and here's what we caught during one of the sampling days. We sampled several times, but you can see uh, the red ear sunfish and the bluegill uh, were the most uh, most common common fish when you you add them up. Uh, the bass were trailing behind. Uh, the snook were were a little less uh, a little less abundant. So you, you you get an idea of the population dynamics. Uh, so from years of study, we find out that the freshwater species account for sixty percent of the fish population. And the saltwater, or the, the freshwater, and then the saltwater, 40% uh, of the population. But we're about split 13, 13, and then four exotics, which are, are uh, some of the, the freshwater uh, exotics. Uh, so the saltwater slash brackish species, the bay anchovy, the snook, golf killy, hog choker, ladyfish, pinfish, red, redfish. The sand perch, sheep's head, uh, the sheep's head minnow, which is uh, different from the sheep's head, striped mullet, the tarpon, and the mahara. The freshwater fish that we have seen, the, the bluegill, bluegill, and the uh, red ear, is the, they're both sunfish. We got the bullhead, which is a type of catfish, the gar, which, which is big, some shiners, uh, the bass, and uh, some some shad. There's also a thread fin uh, that lives in fresh or in salt water as well. Some of the exotics, the tilapia, the armored catfish, and the walking catfish are present in our uh, freshwater ecosystems as exotics. So that would be a sailfin molly. You can see how the mouth is tilted upwards. So they uh, can use the air water interface to gulp in air during anoxic conditions and they also eat things off of the top. They're top water feeders. Uh, there is the seminal killifish. Killifish are also top water eaters and they live uh, in shallow areas. When we do our um, tide pool at Fort DeSoto, we very often see killifish swimming around the top of the tide pool. Uh, as well. Uh, the shad, I say we have a thread fin in the uh, gulf and we also have the thread fin shad in the freshwater, uh, commonly known as uh, white bait, green back, stuff like that. A uh, lot of biomass. The bay anchovy, most abundant fish in our area as far as uh, Tampa Bay and things are uh, glass minnow. Uh, they're also uh, akin, they have a close relative called the silver sides. And you can see that their sides have a silver lateral line on them and they are uh, glassy looking. The Florida gar is an ancient fish, alligator gar. They uh, have these uh, prehistoric scales and armor, armor. So they are living fossils. They have an air bladder to breathe low oxygen water as well. A mosquito fish is another common, uh, eats the larva and helps control mosquitoes. The gizzard shad uh, is in the heron family and uh, it's a brackish fish. Uh, bass, bass eat it. The golden shiner is the Cadillac of bass baits. If you're going to go uh, going for trophy bass, that's what uh, that's what they they use the golden shiner for the best live bait. Uh, the brown bullhead has spine on the dorsal. Uh, they're a type of catfish. They have the barbels. Uh, it is a freshwater catfish. They are uh, Magoria's over was overrun was overrun prior to the restoration with them because they do well in anoxic condition. They're good scavengers and foragers, uh, but they were stunted because there wasn't an abundance of uh, food. The bluegill, you can see got its name by a little blue patch on the operculum. Uh, most common fish in there, the uh, bluegill are a type of sunfish. 
Same with the red ear sunfish. Red ear sunfish are also called brim or shell crackers. So, cause the, you know, it's freshwater, sunfish, panfish, another, another term for the sunfish. Uh, they eat the mollusks and the snails. The largemouth bass is the uh, creme de la creme of freshwater game fish across the country. You know, people in walleye country are, are, might, might argue that, but the bass, the bass pro shop, bass tournaments, it's the most famous of the freshwater game fish. Uh, so, you know, they, they, they get a decent size in Magora. We didn't get any trophies, but, but they were uh, quite abundant, the largemouth bass. Uh, one of the exotics, the blue tilapia. Tilapia are, uh, they're interesting fish. People like them because they are mild white fish. They do well in fish farms because they, they're scavengers. So they eat the, the feces and, and the detritus. Uh, so they're not predators, but they do well. So when you're running a multi-level uh, fish farm and you have a lot of fish waste, the tilapia, clean it up. You don't have to throw it away. You're not wasting. And then you can sell the tilapia as well as whatever fish you're raising in captivity. Uh, one of the reasons I avoid tilapia is, is you know, farm tilapia for sure. Uh, there's the black chin tilapia, the second species of tilapia that are present in the uh, Lake Megori. Uh, so the two tilapia are two of the exotic species. They are mouth brooders, which means they take the eggs after they're laid and fertilized in the mouth to keep them oxygenated you know, because they, they take the water in through the mouth, pass it over the gills. And then, so there would be technically a pregnant, even though you know, you're, you're holding the eggs in your mouth, tilapia. And then look, on the bottom, we, uh, even when they're babies, they first hatch, they hide in the mouth. So sometimes we would have a live well full of tilapia fry uh, that we would just have to release and they would uh, hope for the best. The armored catfish, Placostoma, what they, they call it in the uh, aquarium trade, is uh, an exotic and they can grow two feet. They're native to South America, but you know, they're present in uh, Florida now uh, through the pet trade, flushing things down the toilet or, or whatever. Uh, the walking catfish is native to Asia and it can actually move across land uh, while gulping air, moving from pond to pond. So our four exotics. So the common snook is the freshwater Cadillac of game fish, I, I guess for lack of a better term. And uh, this is a warm water fish. So we're at about the limit of its range. The young ones are male and they turn to female as they mature. So they're hermaphroditic. Uh, that's why a lot of times we slot a fish where when they're young and they're male and then they get big enough. And uh, so we protect that middle while they're reproducing females. And then when they get a little older, and oversized, we, we allow them to be harvested again. Uh, some fish are slotted because uh, like group or change sex or things like that. Uh, other fish are slotted for other reasons. But uh, these guys uh, are tied to the brackish water, tied to the brackish water, and they're tied to warm water. When you start getting north, they become less and less uh, abundant. But places like Crystal River, uh, they can survive in because of the uh, 71 degree water temperature at all times there. But, you know, once you uh, get into areas that drop below 70, uh, they become scarce and then non-existent. And, you know, we got a lot of them. You, you, we, we did well over the years. You can see that's a couple years worth of uh, data. And uh, so that's Lake Megory right there. You can see the cattails. It's an eelgrass community. And there are plenty of large snook in, in Lake Malory. There was the, uh, the, the, the granddaddy of them all, uh, snook that we got in these several years of studying we did. That was, uh, that was a beauty. 
Mullet. Mullet are also present. Again, they're herb er herbivores and they eat the algae detritus. Uh, so that's, that's the mullet. They're the fish that you see jumping all the time. They, they, they leap out of the water, the mullet. Uh, so they are abundant in Lake Megory as well. Uh, there's a whole bunch of students uh, with their trophy fish that we got during the electrofishing before they were released. And uh, that's eelgrass. Like I said, it's an eelgrass community. That is a submergent species of grass that grows in the shallows of fresh and brackish water. Uh, more snook bass habitat. It's rare to get the snook and the bass in the same habitat, like we said. So Lake Megory is a little gem that people don't know about. Uh, some of the other things that we see, the, the ibis and the anhinga, we, uh, and you can see up top, you even got a uh, seagull. Uh, more hens, the red maples, we uh, talk about that is the um, Acer rubrum. The uh, cypress, important. The cypress is an important species. It lives in the anoxic soil. It has these knees. Uh, it is a uh, needle, not a broadleaf tree, but they lose their needles, hence the term bald cypress. Uh, cattails are emergent vegetation on the shores. You can see that there's whole communities of them. And uh, we get some of the seabirds as well because it is a coastal community. It is connected to Tampa Bay. Uh, we get cormorants and anhingas, gulls of all types, terns, uh, and because it is a transition, the Florida gators. So for all you gators fans, it's great to be a Florida gator. They uh, inhabit Lake Megory as well. No offense, you get nothing, sorry. Uh, the red-winged blackbird is one of my favorite birds. Some marsh, high marsh bird, songbird makes beautiful, beautiful music. There's a male. Uh, it's and then the anhinga. Again, uh, there's a male, and they have that pointy beak, long neck, long tail feathers. Uh, one of the things that they're called is water turkey. I don't know where, but water turkey. And this uh, little uh, fish presentation is done. So uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, make sure that you list the fish and the other species in your species log. You're not going to get to see all these fish in real life. But you still want to learn about them. We are talking marine and coastal uh, biology. So uh, some of the things you're going to have to book learn. And, and this is one of them. The, the different fish and being able to ID them. Uh, include them in your uh, practicals. So thank you so much and have a great day.